1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26 through 31. And it says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. <laughs> and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Father in heaven, as we enter into your presence to continue to explore who we are in you, we pray that you would be with us, dear God, and remind us that you have not made a mistake in choosing us, and that your promises stand, dear God, and all that you have ordained to do in and through us, despite how weak we are, despite how we blow it, God, you will fulfill it as long as we continue to stay close to you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, somebody shout amen. 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 You may be seated. And for those of you who know my testimony, you know that I grew up with severe asthma. I mean, it was really intense when I was a little boy. I remember having to go to the hospital every week to get shots. I remember these asthma attacks. I remember spending winters, uh, maybe a week or two in the winter uh, in the hospital because of getting pneumonia mixed in with my asthma. And I also remember when I was about 10 or 11 years old as a boy joining a basketball league right there in my community, right there in the neighborhood, just a little basketball league. And I, I, I made the team. I, I got my, 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 my uniform and everything. And then the first game, I remember that I had a severe asthma attack. And then over the next couple of days, I remember going to the doctor and just getting back healthy. And then I remember sitting down with my mother and the coach of the team and sitting down in the room with them and talking about it and basically the doctors had really suggested that I not play basketball anymore on this team, and so that was the news that they had to give to me that day, the coach and my mother, that I would not be able to stay on the team as a player. And then the coach asked my mother, he said, hey, can I just talk to you alone, Miss Norma? Can I just talk to you without Kevin in the room? And so they put me out of the room, and when they brought me back in, they let me know that the coach wanted me to stay on the team and I could keep my uniform and I could dress out with the team and I was going to be involved in the huddles and helping them to coach a little bit, giving out the towels. And man, I love that. Amen. <laughs> and you just need to know that whatever disadvantages you may have, that God will make room for you. <laughs> whatever challenges you may have, you are still useful to God. And we learned the last time that God is the one who forms us literally while we are yet in our mother's wombs. And sometimes when God makes us a certain way, it seems that God has set us up to lose something, that God has set us up for failure, that God has set us up maybe to be left out. But how many of you know that God will take that which seems that it's not going to work and he'll work it out for his glory and for your advantage? And sometimes it leaves you saying, God, why did you let me be born into such a crazy family? You know what I mean? So much dysfunction. Why was I born with no obvious talent, God? Why was I born poor? Why was I born with this disability? Whatever it may be. But God will use that very thing that seems like a disadvantage to direct you into your purpose. Somebody ought to give God some praise for that. God is able to take our disadvantages and use them in an advantageous way. See, ever since the enemy caused the world to fall into sin back in the garden, we are now born into this world with fallen bodies and fallen circumstances. There's just trouble in this world. But God says that whatever the devil meant for evil, I can use it for good. So God is able to take these disadvantages that we have and use them in an advantageous way. And some of y'all know the rest of my testimony that because of asthma, that one of my doctors recommended that I take up a wind instrument. And so as I went into elementary school, I started playing the saxophone. 
Now, if I had not started playing the saxophone, uh, I wouldn't have gotten a scholarship. And I wouldn't have started playing the saxophone, I don't think, if I didn't have asthma. And if I hadn't gotten a scholarship, I don't know if I would have been able to go to college. And I got saved in college. <laughs> college is where I got my call to be a pastor. You see what I'm saying? God took the not so positive circumstances of my life and he used them to direct me into my purpose. And I just bet that that's your testimony too. That God has taken some things as you've walked with him and he's ordered your steps. Amen. He says, I know the plans I have for you, which is to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you a hope in a future. And this is why God wants us to praise him even in the bad times. Do you know how to praise him in the bad times? He wants us to praise him, not just when the good times are going on, but he wants us to praise him when it's a less than perfect day. He wants us to praise him in the setbacks because, see, God will be in your setbacks and he will set up something to do glorious in your life in another season. Come on now, somebody help me praise the Lord. And so as we look at this passage today, I want you to see that no matter what your circumstances, no matter what you may have been born into, that when you have Christ in your life, you are a new creature and you already have the victory. You are not fighting to get the victory, but for the rest of your life, you are now fighting. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, if you believed on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are now fighting out of a place of victory that you received the moment that you got born again. And so we're still looking at this uh, true identity thing in this series we call, Who Do You Think You Are? And the last time we looked at who you are as created in the image of God, and today we want to look at who you become when you have believed on Jesus. Because if you think you are special because you are created in the image of God, because you are the imago Dei, because you are lovable to God, because you are beautiful to God, because you are valuable to God, because you are useful. If you think you are special because of that, honey, you have not seen nothing yet till you understand how when you are a child of God, how uniquely you are and what God is going to do in your life through his son, Jesus Christ. And so you are a royal priesthood in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You have peace with God, amen? And when you have peace with God, that means you have peace with yourself. You have been set free from the power of sin when you are in Christ Jesus. And now you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And so I have two goals, really, as I preach this word to you today. The first one is that I want to preach to those who've not believed in Jesus. And I want to stir up a greater thirst in you to want to know Jesus Christ and have a personal relationship with him and make him your Lord and Savior and give your all to Christ. Because as you hear about the amazing things that Jesus does when we, when we have him living in us, I want you to have a, just an appetite where you want to taste and see that the Lord is good. And then also, I want to make sure that I speak to the believer, the person who has given his life to Christ, uh, has given her life to Christ, so that you can understand better who you are in Christ. And as a result of that, you can drill down deeper into the riches of Christ and live that abundant life, that abundant life that he gives us and really understand who you are in Christ. Because oftentimes, we as believers, even though we're born again, we live as though we're not. We live as though we have no power. It reminds me of the man who lived down in Texas. He had bought this land. He had this family, and everything was really a struggle for him. And finally, these drillers came to him one day, and they said, we want to set a bargain with you. We believe there's some oil on your land, and we want to drill down and see if we can find some. And so he made this deal with him. Just the long and short of it, within the next 10 years, this man was a billionaire. And I want to say that some of us, we've gotten born again. We've moved on the property of knowing Christ, but we don't realize what we've got in Christ. And we are still acting like we're paupers when we are billionaires in Christ Jesus. God has called us to that abundant life. And so the first thing I want us to look at from Paul here in this particular passage is that you are chosen. You are chosen. When you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you have believed on the Lord Jesus, that means that you are chosen in Christ Jesus. Somebody say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. Amen. Yes, that's, that's right. You are chosen. 
It says in verse 27 that God has chosen, look at this, the foolish things. It says that God has chosen the weak thing. Over and over it uses this word chosen, that God chooses us. He's chosen us, and when he's chosen us, that means we're not just creation of God. We're not just the imago Dei. We are now a child of God. We are in the family of God. And it's so important to get this when it comes to your identity in Christ because it speaks to the fact that God has adopted you. We are adopted into the family of God. It speaks to the fact that God has brought you near. Uh, the Bible says that we were once far off from God. But now we have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. And this being brought near to God, it not only means that God is near to you, but that God is living inside of you by his Holy Spirit. It means that God has adopted you and that Jesus, when he died on the cross, his blood was satisfactory payment to redeem you and purchase you and bring you legally into the family of God. And so you are not only a creation of God at this point, but you are now a child of God. Uh, Ephesians 1 gives a little bit better understanding. So look at this with me. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, look at verse 4. And Paul says here, just as he chose us in him, that is, as the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's a long time ago. That means before the world was built that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined, you see that word? To adopt us as sons, that means children, so that's sons and daughters, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Let me just break this down to you, what he's saying. He's saying that before God created the world, God knew you. And he knew he would create you. That's a long time ago, y'all. And he knew that he would create Adam and Eve, and he knew that Adam and Eve would fall away so that he knew that they would have sin, and he knew that you would be born in sin and that I would be born in sin, separated from God. But even though he knew all of that, he decided beforehand to choose you and to pay for your sins by sending Jesus his son so that he could not only make you a part of his kingdom despite your sins, despite my sins, but make us part of his family by adopting us. In a word, you are chosen. And you ought to give God some praise for that. Amen? Now, how does he choose us? How does God make this decision as to who he chooses? Mm. Well, first of all, I want to remind you that we still have what I call real volition. We really have freedom of choice. We have skin in this game. We have a will. We can make our own decisions. We talked about this the last time we talked about the Imago Dei being made in his image, that God has given us volition and freedom of choice. And so we talked about how God has given us Unlike all of his other creation, unlike planets, unlike bears, unlike orangutans, unlike salamanders, God has given us, human beings, the ability to choose different from how he wants us to be and what he wants us to do. He's given us the ability to literally be contrary to him. He's even given us the ability that we can choose to hate God, and some people do. We can choose to shake our fist at God, and some people do. Uh, we can choose to ignore God. We can choose to disagree with God's perspective in his word. We can choose to try to discredit God, and many people try to discredit God. We can choose to downgrade God's perspective and then elevate our perspective as better than God's perspective. Many people do that all the time. We can revolt against God. We can resist God. And so he does not want us to be robotic. He loves us with all of his heart, and so he created us where we have freedom of choice. We get to choose even though God chooses us. Wait a minute. Come on, now, how does that work? Well, it's complicated, okay? <laughs> it's a mystery. It's a paradox, okay? It's one of those times that I, as your pastor, and I think any theologian who's honest would have to say to you, I don't know how that works, amen? You know, I don't know how those two things work together without contradicting one another, but they don't contradict one another. They are paradox. So you got to understand that God says that some of his ways are past finding out. <laughs> God doesn't let us know everything about him, amen? He's the one with infinite wisdom, not me, not you, amen? In fact, he says it's to his glory 
to conceal certain things about himself. He said, if I give y'all too much information, y'all gonna get the big head. Y'all gonna try and write a book about it, make money. If I give y'all too much information about me, y'all gonna try to reproduce me in a lab, and I'm not gonna let y'all do that. But here's what I can tell you about how God chooses. Here's one very special thing I believe with all my heart, and I believe the word of God backs this up as to how God chooses, how God predestines, how God predetermines. Here's what I believe. You ready for this? I believe one of the key things is that God looks at the heart. God is able to look straight through you, straight through me, God's able to look straight into you, I mean the real you, and into the real me and see the sincerity of our hearts or the insincerity of our heart. He's able to see if, we're really, if we really want to know him, if we really want to love him, if we really want to follow him. Now, I can't see that, and you can't see that either. And so we can fool each other. We can act a certain way. We can search certain things on the outside, and we could be lying. Come on now. And so as human beings, we can fool some of the people some of the time, and some people are so gullible, you can fool them all the time. But you can never fool God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. I mean, we think we're smarter than God sometimes, but we're not. Because God is able to know our hearts, and that's what he looks at. He says he doesn't choose those who are smart. Remember that in the passage? He doesn't choose those who are smart according to the world's standards or those who are famous or those who have money, but he chooses the foolish things and he chooses the despised things, not from the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. Remember when Samuel had to anoint a king and he went to Jesse's house and Jesse paraded out all of his sons, all of his older sons who looked like kings and who had war experience. And he didn't even bring his son, David, who was out in the field in to check out. And, and after he looked at all of these different people, he said, the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, he's not here yet. There's another one. And so he said to Jesse, is there someone else? Jesse said, oh, yeah, by the way, an afterthought. And by the way, you need to understand if God has something for you, he's not going to let the world overlook you. Amen. And they brought David in, and surely it was David. And what did God say? That God said that David was a man after my own heart. Because God does not look at the outward appearance, but he looks at what? The heart. And so here's what I want us to do. In this moment, I want you to check your heart, not your habits, not your outward appearance, not your brand, not your best pictures that you post on Instagram, not your public image, but check your heart. And here's the question. You say, God, I know that I come to church. I know I've developed a lot of good habits, but do I really love you? and want to live for you. You are chosen. Not only are you chosen, but here's another identity in Christ. If you believed on Jesus Christ, you are clean. Oh, glory to God. You are clean. You are clean, amen? Paul, in this letter to the Corinthians, when he opens this letter, he calls the Corinthians saints. If you look over in chapter 1, in verse 2, you'll see that the word in the Greek is hagios, holy ones, those who are clean before God. He's saying they are clean, they are holy because now they are in Christ Jesus. Now, you got to understand from an earthly standpoint, this is ironic because most likely if you lived in Corinth, the last thing you had been before you were born again was clean. Uh, the last thing you may have been doing was to be living a clean and holy life because Corinth was a place of immorality. It was a, it was a wealthy city. It was, because of its proximity to the Asian Sea, uh, kind of a main place where there was a lot of export and import. So there was a lot of business done there, a lot of businessmen, a lot of business people in and out there visiting the city. It was, it was, a, it was a main city in, in ancient Greece at this time. But you've got to understand that also it had the temple of Aphrodite there. And the temple of and Aphrodite is the love goddess. And so the temple of Aphrodite is there. And it's, it boasts of a thousand prostitutes within this temple that did all these sexual ceremonies, calling it worship. 
And as the nighttime came and all these business people were there, these temple prostitutes would just fan out throughout the city soliciting people to come and be involved in this so-called worship, which was really sexual immorality. So there was a lot of money flowing in the city, and there was a lot of immorality flowing, but not only immorality in the city, but there was also immorality that had seeped into the church, among the church folks. The climate of this city had, had gotten so bad that it was affecting the church because Paul had to call out a family in the church it talks about this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 6 where the stepson was having a fling, a sexual affair with his stepmother. Crazy, crazy stuff. I, I'm glad that doesn't happen in the church anymore today. Amen. Come on now. But despite all the craziness, he says to those who are born again, you are clean. Let me stop for a minute and just say to somebody who feels real dirty from your past, you know, because the enemy will just haunt you about some of the stuff you've done. And some of us, maybe we, you just may have done some of everything. You know, you've just been out there sexually, immorality, unethically. You may even have blood on your hands. I don't know. But you need to understand that when you get born again, God says that you are now clean. Can I pronounce that over you? That there is now no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. That if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God has made you new in him. And Satan will try to condemn us. And by condemning us, he lures us back into that defeated life because you've got to understand something about the conscience. The Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, is living in you and the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sins in order for you to repent and continue to be more like God wants you to be. But the enemy is a condemner. He's an accuser. He will condemn you about your sins in the past in order to cause you to feel like you haven't changed and you can't change, and it's all, it's all just an attempt to pull you back into something that you used to do. And you have to be very careful to not allow the enemy to do that to you. So you need to understand that Satan is going to try to condemn you. And so that's one thing you need to understand. The second thing you need to understand is that when you get born again and your new identity in Christ, he says you're not only clean in my sight, but now you have the power to live clean in your daily life. He even gives us a desire. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, there is a desire. That doesn't mean that we don't mess up. But I remember when I first got born again and I hadn't been saved for maybe two months and I fell totally, completely, fully back into sin. But it was different this time, y'all. I didn't feel good about it. I wanted to get back up and get back on track. I could tell the Spirit of God was living in me. I didn't used to feel that way at all about my sins. This was different. And that's how you know because he gives you a desire for righteousness when he comes to live in you. Jesus says, blessed are those who thirst after righteousness for they shall see God. And so he gives you that desire. He gives you that thirst. And the Bible talks about as newborn babes, we ought to crave. We begin to desire, passionately desire the, the word of God, God's righteousness and his ways that he wants us to know. Look at this. He talks about this. Peter talks about this over in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. He's talking to believers who have the Holy Spirit living in them. You know he's talking to believers because in verse 14 he says, as obedient children. Not simply a creation of God, not simply the imago Dei, but a child of God. And notice how he defines them now as children. We are able to obey. Let that word really sink in there that now because of the Holy Spirit he's given us the power that we can get clean we are able to obey see before I was saved I really didn't have much choice my sins they could just really consume me but now I have the power of the Holy Spirit living in me and I'm getting a little ahead of myself because this comes under my next point but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world and so now Paul talks about I can now offer my body as a body for righteousness for God I don't have to keep offering my body as a body of unrighteousness for the devil. Yeah. 
He says, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves, do not conform to this world, but be transformed. There's that now I can become more holy. The word transform is from that word that you use with caterpillars and butterflies, turn into butterflies, metamorphosis. It's the same word in the Greek, metamorphe. He says, be transformed. Now I can, I can say no to sin. I can become more and more. And we never reach perfection while we're in these fallen bodies on this side of eternity. But we should be being more holy. We should be being more like the Lord. So he says, not conforming yourself to the former lust. That's the way you used to be. As in your ignorance, you didn't know any better. Now you've got the word of God before you and you have the spirit of God living in you. He says in verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, this is a command, it's not a suggestion, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. This is part of your identity now. In fact, Peter says in another place that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. What's next? A holy nation. It's part, it's, it's part of our distinction. This is why we should not look like the world. We, we, we should not look like the world, not because we're trying to think we're better than them or we're condescending to them. We should look like, not look like the world so we can be on display to the world. Here's how God can deliver. Here's how God can make me clean. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. So we become a billboard for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is able to do in other people's life. You say, well, how do I begin to get to this point where I say no to sin more and I say yes to God's righteousness more? First of all, you got to stay close to God. But secondly, there's a scripture that you should memorize, and it's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, is verse 13. I memorized this scripture by first year of being saved, and I've been born again for decades. And some of the people who were discipling me, they said, you need this in your spirit. You need to understand this. And 1 Corinthians 13 basically says, no temptation has taken you except that which is common to other people. And then it says, but God is faithful. And with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape. And so you have to begin to say, Lord, show me my way of escape. Now, a way of escape, it may not be big, okay? It may not be, you know, if you're trying to get saved off of, off of drowning, it may not be this big old boat that comes. It may just be a little bitty rope, but you got to grab it, okay? God, show me my way of escape and help me to make, take advantage of my way of escape. When, when Joseph was, was tempted and propositioned by Potiphar's wife to try to have sex with her, you know what he had to do, his way of escape? He just ran. He just ran away. It wasn't the time to try and share a Bible verse and let's pray about this. You know, you know you're doing wrong. I want to pray with you. Do you want to give your life to Jesus? No, it wasn't the time. He just, he just, he had to get out of there. You are chosen. You are clean. Here's a third identity. You are a conqueror. You are a conqueror. You are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Now understand something here. The Bible tells us that God always gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. We always have the victory. And you say, well, if we always have the victory, why do I go through some hardships and difficulties? Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. But he says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And you've got to understand there are two types of victories that God gives us. The most important one is our eternal victory, that we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul talks about something over in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. He talks about in verse 16 how we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. He says earlier in verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. He says, we are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We're even struck down, but we're not destroyed. So you've got to understand that we have the victory. Listen, I have read to the end of the book, and we win. Amen? You have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Amen? But I believe we even have eternal life in Christ Jesus. We, we even have earthly victories if we are 
to be careful to make sure we heed the Lord when we're going through something. When you're going through a trial, if you do things God's way, God's going to bring you through that with a victory. You say, my sickness, yeah, he'll bring you through that with a victory. Think about the, the three Hebrews when they were thrown into that fiery fire, fire, furnace. Think about that, how they, what they did to have the victory. They, they had to wait on their victory. They were in the fire. Some of you are in the fire right now concerning your marriage. Some of you are in the fire right now concerning something that you're going through, and you've got to wait on your victory. But what did they do as they waited on their victory? Well, first of all, they were together. And so they, it's so important that as we're going through something that we stay with other believers, that we stay connected, we stay in fellowship. So it's good that you are here today. Amen. Come on, give God some praise that he got you into the house of the Lord. It's good that you are in small group, that you are fellowshipping with other believers and you're praying together. So they were together in the fire. But then not only that, they were close to Jesus because there was a fourth person that showed up in the fire. Come on now. And so you got to make sure you continue to press into Jesus. And understand, when you're going through a fire, Jesus will press into you even the more. Jesus will reveal himself to you even the more. All you've got to do is position yourself to be still and know that he's God and he wants to speak to you. Amen. But then they were moving around in the fire. That means they were working. See, the difference between waiting on the Lord and what the world may think waiting is, is that you're working while you're waiting. Amen. <laughs> I'm getting ready for what God's going to do. They were moving around in there. And then some believe that they were worshiping as they were in that waiting period. So you've got to understand the importance of your identity in Christ Jesus is that when you're going through something, you've got to praise the Lord. This is so important because praise, first of all, in order to praise God, you have to spend time with God. You've got to know something about him. You've got to know what it means when you say he's Jehovah Jireh. You've got to have spent some time with him to know what he can do. And so you're praising him and because now you've spent some time with him and you're also praising him and that's strengthening your faith. You're praising him and you're blessing him and giving him the glory, which lets him know that he can move in your situation because you're trusting him. Somebody better give God some praise because when the praises go up, the blessings truly come down. And not only are you chosen in Christ Jesus and not only are you clean and not only are you a conqueror, but you are also complete in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that we are complete in Christ. This is so important because so many of us are trying to get complete from this world. We're wearing ourselves out trying to make ourselves full enough or enough for somebody, whatever, pretty enough, handsome enough, make enough money, drive the right car in my parked in my driveway, living in the right house, being able to post the right type of vacations on Instagram. We're just trying to be complete. We just want a certain amount of likes and affirmation and validation from people. But he talks about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about in verse 29 that he says that God has chosen the foolish things and the base things and all of that so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. See, the only person who completes you is God. And as long as we're grappling around here trying to let man please us or something we do please us and satisfy us, we will never be pleased and satisfied. A great mountain climber who climbed Mount Everest, one of the first ones to climb Mount Everest, and he spent years trying to get to the top of Mount, to get to that summit, and he finally got there, and he is known for these famous words, now that I'm here, there has to be more. Whenever you are trying to accomplish something and fulfill yourself with things of this earth, there's always going to have to be more. You will accomplish things. Did you hear the, the interview with Oprah Winfrey when she talked about, you know, I always feel like I need a little bit more money. What? Let's just trade places for a minute, Oprah, and I'll. We always want a little bit more. Only God can satisfy the longing of our souls. There's a God-shaped void in your heart that only God can fill, and it's like a puzzle that's missing that final piece. And you may think it's your dream car, and you try and push that in there, but the pieces really don't fit. And all of a sudden, the car rusts. And all of a sudden, your neighbor across the street two years later gets something much nicer than you ever got. Like, man. But only God can complete us. And we have to know that. Remember Gideon? Look over in Judges 6. We're almost done, but I'm just thinking about Gideon. 
Because this is so amazing. This is such an example of how only God can complete us. Gideon was down in the wine press because the Midianites had attacked the people of Israel, and the people of Israel had basically resorted to hiding. Hiding in caves, wine presses, crevices, wherever they can, instead of fighting. They had lost the sense of identity of who they were. And remember when, when, when God shows up, the Lord shows up, Judges chapter 6 and verse 12, and he declares over Gideon who he really is. He says, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. But Gideon, you're acting like a defeated person. Now, Gideon, I am the only one who have your real name, God. You are mighty through me and you can do all things through me. So now, Gideon, I want you to go in the strength that I give you because I am with you and I want you to lead your people to defeat your enemy because your real title is not defeated. Your real title is defeater. Your real title is not conquered. Your real title is conqueror. Somewhere along the way through your experiences and what people said to you and what they posted on your social media soul, you got it twisted and you allow some other labels, labels to settle in. But you are a more than conqueror person. You are a mighty man of valor. You are a mighty woman of valor. See, whenever you encounter the living God, whenever you have a real encounter with the living God, whenever you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, he's going to change your name. He's going to change your name that whenever you really have a touch from God, you're going to know it because he's going to change your name. Think about Jacob, how Jacob was a hustler, and Jacob's name means get over and swindler and hustler. But then when God wrestled with him and wrestled him down, he, he touched him in the hip of his socket and he changed his name to Israel, that now your name is that you will fight for God. God did the same thing to Saul, whom he named Paul. Did the same thing to Simon, whom he named Peter. Did the same thing to Abram, who he named Abraham. God will do the same thing to you. When you begin to have an encounter with God, he's going to declare your real name over you. When God comes into your life, he touches you afresh as a new creature. And he gives you that new name. And whenever God changed your name, he's going to make you know that you are a mighty person of valor. I love this because when he told Gideon this, Gideon said, look at verse 15, if you're over in Judges 6, we're almost done. He said, Lord, how can I save Israel because my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house? Who told you that? Remember we talked about who told you that last week? Now, you got to understand what he's saying. He's saying Israel, from his viewpoint, and maybe Israel feels this way, they're hiding instead of fighting. They are the lowest, lowest nation in this area on the totem pole of all countries. But then it gets worse. His tribe, he viewed the Manasseh tribe as the lowest tribe in the nation of Israel. But then it gets worse. He says his family, his clan, is the lowest family of the lowest tribe of the lowest nation of all the countries. That's just low. He got low self-esteem, okay? Top it off, he declares himself as the lowest family member. We do the same thing. We just put ourselves down real low. This was a low down dude right here though, man. He was. Now, I love this because the Lord didn't try to build Gideon's self-esteem back up. You know what, Gideon, you really are a better fighter than you think. It wasn't that bad. Or, you know what, Gideon, give yourself some credit. You haven't made as many mistakes as you thought. Or, Gideon, you're not as ugly as they say you are. I know they call you ugly. He didn't do any of that. Look at verse 16. He said, surely <laughs> I will be with you. <laughs> God completed him. He said, I will be with you, therefore you will defeat the Midianites. I will be with you because I am with you, you will have the victory. See, it's not about self-esteem. It's about Christ's esteem. It's not about man's power or human potential. It's about God's presence. If you want to feel better about yourself, I mean, if you really, really want to feel better about yourself and really make some growth in that area and just not keep going around in circles and feeling bad every six months or so, if you really want to build your self-esteem, you have to spend more time understanding who Christ is in you and who you are in Christ. 
You're never going to feel good about yourself as long as you're trying to measure yourself according to what the world says success is. You know, ladies, as soon as you get as cute as you want to get, there's another generation that's moving into adulthood. <laughs> I'm just saying. The problem with so many Christians today is that we don't know who we are in Christ. We measure ourselves with the same standards as the world, and we don't spend enough time with God to learn what he says we are and who we are in him. That you are clean. This makes you incredibly unique, that you are holy, that you've been set free from the power of sin, and that you can change habits that threaten to destroy you and your family and the people you love. You don't have to do them anymore. Do you realize what a privilege that is? In Christ, that you are a royal priesthood, that you are literally God's ambassadors, that you reflect to the world the beauty of Christ, that you are commissioned, that God has said, I want to use you as a mouthpiece to speak of me and to testify of me, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that he completes you. He completes us. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. He completes me. Let me ask you something. Which label have you allowed to stick, Gideon, on you? Based on your experiences, based on what enough people said about you, based on how you've allowed yourself to feel about yourself. All three of those categories are not more credible than what God says about you. But we allow those three categories to so shape our self-worth, our self-esteem, our identity. Which labels have you allowed to land on you? Ah, well, I'm just a divorcee. God says, when I show up, I'll change your name from divorcee to relationship builder. Amen? Come on now. I'm just a dropout. I never finish anything. God says, when I show up, I will give you the tenacity where you will be a finisher, amen? You will run your race and you will finish what I've given you to do. Oh, I'm just an addict. God says, when I show up, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to make you a bondage breaker. Come on, somebody better give God some praise. God has called you clean and chosen and a conqueror and complete in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on now, give him praise. Father God, we come into your presence, dear God, and Lord, we pray that you would give those who are not believers an appetite to want to know you because of the incredible benefits of what it means in their identity to be a child of God, to be able to be chosen, to be clean, dear God, to be able to be a conqueror and to be complete and quit striving to try and press man or try to feed some insatiable appetite in their own soul to feel good about themselves. God, I want to pronounce and declare over those who are here, dear God, that they are mighty men and women of valor. I want to pray in the name of Jesus that Satan will be bound, that spirit that has condemned that has said, I'm the lowest, the least in this category, the least in this category, the least in this category, while you see us as mighty men and women, as defeaters and not defeated, as conquerors and not conquered. You're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. It's a beautiful thing that you have been made in the image of God, but you not only want to be a creation of God, more importantly, you really want to be complete in him. You want to be a child of God. He's calling you today. And there are some people who thought you were Christian, but as you begin to check your heart, you realize that, hey, my motivation haven't been right. I've learned some good habits. I want to do the right thing, but I've never really fully said, God, I want to love you with all my heart 
and live for you with all of my heart. And God doesn't look at the outward. He looks at the heart. He's looking for men and women after his heart. And you're here today and you're realizing my heart has not been surrendered to God, even though I've been in church for a while, even though I've been around Christianity all my life, my heart is not surrendered to God. And you've got to understand the Bible says that you get saved when you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. And to make him Lord means you give him your whole heart, not part of your heart. You give him your heart that's related to your bedroom. You give him your heart that's related to your appetites. You give him your heart that's related to your finance book. You give him your heart that's related to your relationships. You give him all your heart. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And he's calling you to do that today. And you would be wise to not, to cease hiding behind religion. And feel good experiences in church and say, I really want a relationship with God. If that's you today and you want to give your life to Christ. And there are others who want to give their lives to Christ because you're just realizing by the preached word that, hey, I'm not complete. I'm not clean. I have no power over sin. I don't have an intimate relationship with God where he's living in me. I'm not chosen, at least not yet. And you want to do that, which you pray and give your lives to Christ. I want to lead you in a prayer right now. Just say, dear Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. I thank you that you love me so much that you redeemed me by dying on the cross. And you are able to adopt me into your family. Say, Jesus, in this moment, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and I believe on you completely as my Lord and Savior. I give you my whole heart. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Say, Jesus, make me clean. I turn from my sins and I turn to you with love, joy, and desire. Say this, Jesus, I'm weak and I'm going to need your help. But I thank you that when I fall down, you're going to pick me back up and keep me on the right track because you live in me now. Father, we give you the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.